Yuri, I'm from Skate, and welcome to my presentation Crossing Horizons with Skate, Mastering iOS and Android Development with Swift. So when we start to create a mobile application, it's very often it's, uh, just a constant dilemma whether we want to build a, an application for iOS or for both platforms. Do we want to start with the Android or with the iOS, or maybe we want to build at the same time an application for both platforms entering, let's say, cross-platform world. And uh, we have, of course, uh, advantages, disadvantages uh, between these two approaches. If you build a native application, we get a fast and responsive application with the native features which are available on a particular platform. But they have also a problem if you need to build two applications, we cannot share and reuse the code because on Android we have so on the light is to the face. So because on Android we have one programming language on iOS uh, another, so we cannot share the code and that's why we have higher maintenance. We have uh, to support both uh, uh, applications uh, and uh, it's cost intensive because we need to create two applications instead of one. And if we go cross-platform approach, uh, we have, uh, of course, advantages like single code base, so we write um, an application using one programming language, and it's much faster, but we have, of course, differences between the operating systems, and everybody can notice sometimes the cross-platform application is not uh, so cool like a native application. And uh, there is also a problem of delayed features. So if Apple brings new features to the iOS, we have to wait uh, up to they will be available on a cross-platform uh, framework. So looking into it, at to the landscape of the cross-platform development, we can notice basically that we have two uh, major platforms, Apple with the Swift language as the main language for the platform, and the Android with the Kotlin as the uh, development language. But if you look into the, the cross-platform frameworks, we can notice that they use um, another ecosystem. So if we, this is an example I presented here, three largest uh, cross-platform frameworks. They have a Flutter from Google. They have their own programming language, Dart. In Xamarin, they have to use C Sharp. In uh, React Native, they have JavaScript. So we asked ourselves, do we always need to leave the ecosystem of uh, mobile platform in order to be cross-platform? And if you look into details, we'll see one possible solution right now. Um, that guys from JetBrains, they did, they had the same thoughts, and then they created Kotlin Native because they decided, well, if I'm already on an Android, maybe I can go to to iOS because why should I use? Why should I switch the ecosystem completely? And um, we are at Skate basically doing another way around. Just for understanding, we are working on bringing Swift to Android so that Swift developers can uh, create applications for Android as well. So a couple of words about uh, our project. We started in 2013 and we started building cross-platform with the Lua as a programming language. And we understood it really fast that it's it's a pain to, to use some language which is not native for any of the platform. So uh, we created, we had also our IDE and we started to develop mobile applications uh, with the Lua. But uh, then as uh, Swift 2.0 came out, we were expressed uh, and impressed about the language. And in 2015, we decided to take a language which is native for the platform and we switched to uh, Swift. And starting from 2016, we had a full Android support, including Objective-C. And uh, we deprecated Objective-C porting starting from Swift 5.5 because it took extremely lot of resources and now we don't have Objective-C support. And starting from 2019, we also switched to native, uh, we created our own IDE as a native application for Mac because we just wanted to be as native as possible for, for one platform. And during this period of time, what we have learned is that if you want to develop for both platforms, you should stay at least in one. The one platform should be your native platform because we have native instruments and every developer wants to use native instruments, debugger, compiler, all the stuff which we have from Apple or from Google, for example. 
And what we have also learned is that it's extremely important to do development with the community. So we cannot have like a project or a company doing cross platform without uh, in, um, inviting community to support and uh, to build together the tools. And very really important thing which we also learned is that there are different levels of cross platform integration. Um, because normally if you talk about, for example, React Native, um, the level where we decide that I want to go with a React Native is basically the, the one way uh, I have no way back. As soon as I started to develop in React Native, it's really difficult in the middle to switch the technology on to say, uh, for example, some parts of the application I want to create using native instruments or just because you need to rewrite everything if you want to, to switch. That's why we looked into these levels and we noticed that there are different mobile applications and sometimes you can allow you to do everything cross-platform, but sometimes you have a couple of buttons and a video control, which is really difficult to, uh, to implement using cross-platform frameworks. That's why we developed so-called so like labels in our uh, SCADE project, where we say we can do step-by-step -step integration of the cross-platform. And the first level for us is, is really extremely simple. We imagine we create uh, two applications and we, we built an iOS application, an Android application, and in this level we want to share the code. We have the code which is platform independent. There is some maybe communication with the backend server, parsing data, validating data. There are a lot of boilerplate uh, code, and we don't want to rewrite this just another, in another language. And this was our starting point when we decided, well, we want to bring Swift with its standard library to Android so that we can continue building Android applications in Android Studio, but we can call the code which is written in Swift and uh, which was created originally for the iOS. And for this step, we started to, we, we took the tool chain which Apple open sourced, the Swift is an open source project, and starting from the Swift 2.0, we started to apply patches uh, basically to every version in order to support uh, Android seamlessly. And uh, now we support uh, 5.8 and we're working 5.9, so uh, it will be available within next months, maybe weeks. It depends how many changes Apple did uh, in the compiler. And it's also a really nice thing because Apple changes a lot inside the code of the compiler. But the, 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 the main feature which we have here is, for example, we support uh, 32 bits on Android. So there is no support of 32 bits in, in the Apple code base at all. And there are a lot of devices still uh, running Android and they have 32 bits uh, chips. So we ported basically all tools. So we have a Swift package management, we have source kit, we have the language server protocol, so um, debugger, everything what you find in normal tool chain, which you can download from the uh, Apple web page, will be inside. And the difference is just the compiler understands Android uh, triple. So we, you can provide an Android and it will start building code for Android. And in order to be able to share meaningful code, you have to support, of course, standard library. So we took the Swift Foundation library and we extended it to the level that you can, um, it's, it's completely the same what you have on Apple. So as long as you use your foundation framework, you can build and use uh, this functionality on Android. So we extended uh, missing uh, features, we implemented some uh, utilities which uh, were not available for Android or for Linux. And so how we share the code? Basically, we, we create a Swift package and we write the whole shared code in one package and we build this package using a Swift compiler. At the end, we have a dialib uh, dynamic library which we can then import into this Android Studio and using GNI, we call just the functions there. So at this step, as you can see, you don't have any any vendor log or anything, you, you, you just use a compiler and you, you share your simple code. And then after, after this step, we were thinking about like, well, I, I started already to use the Swift, maybe I can start writing code which will call my operating system. Uh, 
maybe I can start writing the platform dependent code. And for this purpose, we created a Swift Android library. It's just a normal library which makes available the whole Android API in Swift so that I can create more code and I can access Android API, but without leaving the language, which I got used to, which I use every day. And in, in, in this way, we have, of course, the Swift frameworks on the iOS platform. You can continue to work with it in the, the normal way. And on the Android, Android side, the code is executed on Android, has this ability to access the API. It's just easy to understand just by this example. Um, Imagine, for example, I have like, a, I want to be notified by about the location changes. And, and on Android API, if you open like the documentation, you'll find exactly this example. In Kotlin, but, well, I never used Kotlin, that's why Java is I'm more familiar with it. So I took this example um, from the documentation and our goal was to bring the Android API to Swift as similar as possible. So that if you read the Android API documentation, you don't think about how to call these API functions. It has to be as similar as possible. And imagine here, for example, in, in Android world, we uh, import packages, Android content, Android location, and we just implement an interface location listener and try the function. On the Swift side, using our Swift Android framework, you do basically the same for the import for the content package. You import Android content module, Android location, and then you write the code, which is extremely similar. Yeah? You, you have like an object additionally. And all interfaces which are available on Android are mapped to protocols so that our goal was to make writing the code, accessing the Android API the, as similar as possible on Android so that every Android developer or Swift developer can, can do this. So we implement this uh, uh, location listener, for example, and the location listener registration is a piece of Java code, is also from the Android API documentation, and you can compare it with the Swift code, it's, it's extremely similar. Uh, the only difference basically is that in, in our code you, you have to get the current activity, and on Android normally you execute the code within an activity. And um, after doing this, we started to write a two types of code, the shared code, which can be shared between the platform, but we also started to use the Android API. It was really cool because I just, we could use our normal instruments and execute the, 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 the code on Android, access the APIs, but we uh, never did an UI. And then we came to the idea, well, if I write the code, maybe I can merge this code into the packages like uh, wrappers and make it available for the community. So that nobody will check now Android API and, and look how I can be notified about the uh, location changes. Um, the code which I presented before, I can wrap um, in, in the SPM library and make it available for the community. And from this, we just called it Fusion and started to, to write such libraries for internal projects. And every time we had to call the API, we just created a library and put it and make, made it available. And this is an example of the package, how we create these libraries. So basically we, we create three targets always. The one is, uh, we call it, um, this is an example about the fusion location. We call one target, we call it common. We, uh, I think we, we define the uh, protocols there. And then we have two targets, one is for Apple and one is for Android. And in every of these targets, we implement our um, uh, protocols using the uh, platform specific features. And uh, because we have a port of the tool chain, we can specify in the package file the Android um, as an enum, and we use the conditional dependencies. And then this package is an example that when I build the Fusion location Android target, it will be built only for Android. And the Apple part will be built for iOS and macOS. Um, then we integrate the Android API, the, the, the whole stuff which I showed you, it's, it's available also on GitHub, it's just a normal SPM, which I can add um, as a package, and then the whole Android API becomes available for me. After adding this, I can, um, publishing this library, so the Fusion location were published, was published, for example, 
And as a user, I use the diffusion location starting from this point really easy. I don't want to care about the details. In, in, in most cases, I don't care about this. And in the special cases, I can always call the platform specific stuff. But if I just want to track location, I can um, write, write this code once, pack it into uh, an SPM package, and then in my application, I just import fusion location and I just use this uh, abstract API, which I defined in a, in a common target uh, before. So after this, we started like, um, we created a set of such libraries. Every time we access any functionality on, on Android, on, a, on, a, on a iOS, we just create such a library. We have a location, NFC, media, Bluetooth, local authentication, payments, um, and everything what we did, we just put into the libraries. And that's why also we, we would be happy if community would join us and will uh, work with us uh, on, the, on, the, on the libraries. So uh, starting from this point, we were like, the three levels were really happy. We never touched the UI. We always said, okay, the UI will be created um, in Xcode or in Android Studio, and the rest of the, the functionality can be written in Swift. We can share it, but sometimes we had also cases where we had the applications we didn't want just even to create the UI. And uh, this is for us the, the level four, which is basically making everything already like a cross-platform framework. As soon as you, you are on the level four, it's difficult to come back because you start to create UI using non-native frameworks. And in our case, it was the, this is the skate kit. This is our framework with, which we started with in 2013 to build it. This is a framework for building a UI. So the skate kit framework is the structure is really simple. It's, it contains uh, and consists of two parts, graphics and UI. And the graphics under the hood, we have a thin layer, we called it Phoenix. And this layer maps all the calls to the graphics and maps to the underlying architecture. And, I, and on iOS, we have a core graphics. On Android, we have Skia. And we have also an implementation for GTK, FQT, because yeah, basically we can use it also not only for mobile development. And um, these graphics, because we start 2013, maybe we will be surprised, but all our UI is basically an SVG. So we implemented uh, almost 98% of the SVG specification, and we used SVG as a format to define our UIs. It was 10 years ago, we didn't have a Swift UI, and we wanted to do something similar. And our use case was always, we had designers, designers gave us an SVG with the design of a mobile application, and we didn't want to use it as an image. We took an SVG and we wanted to manipulate it during the runtime, making basically what we do now in SwiftUI. And um, now we use for some use cases KitKit. As an example, just how we would how 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 we just create the, the pages using this KitKit. Imagine on the left side you have like an, a design created by a designer. We have it in, in Figma, for example. We extract it into the SVG, and now I see that, okay, I have a nice controls, a collection view, and I don't want to create a cross-platform collection view because I don't want just to invest too much time. It will be always not natural. And at this place, we just throw away two pieces. Then we have an SVG at the end. And if you use our skate kit framework in the runtime, this is not just a picture. You can access every element of this SVG. You can every symbol, every icon is, is in an object. I can add a tap event, for example. And it's really nice for her to, to, to have her buttons because this uh, has simply um, very simple UI elements. And at this place, we can, in the runtime, we can inject the native controls into the SVG tree. And at the end, you have an application where you cannot, basically, you do not notice that you have native controls and non-native controls, and at some places you don't have controls at all. So pressing the button, like the home button, will be just a normal button, um, but just for understanding, like, 
cross-platform make to make a button cross-platform is easy, but to replicate a nice collection view which is available on iOS and and with the with the um, operating system effects and do the same on Android is really hard and it, it looks always uh, different. That's why we came to this approach and uh, we use it for uh, internal projects and um, this is just our way how to integrate the UI. And then we define these four steps in order just to come to the publicity and say, well, we don't want you just to start immediately using SkateKit, but we want to present these four levels where you want where you can uh, decide whether I share the code at the beginning, then I invest a little bit more and start using the Android API. And we packed it everything all together in our own ID. It's just a normal native um, Mac application. Why we packed it in a separate application? Because as soon as you start writing code, which is Android specific, for example, for Android API, you cannot use Xcode anymore. So if I would specify now my uh, Swift Android toolchain. As soon as I have somewhere dot .android, the Xcode starts underlying everything and say uh, it's it's wrong. It's wrong, there is no Android. No, 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 remove it. <laughs> but because we have all the all the tooling, we have a source kit LSP, we just decided, well, we can uh, uh, create a couple of plugins for an open source editor. It's based on an open source editor uh, called uh, uh, Nimble. And uh, we added the plugins in order just to simplify the development of, uh, of Android applications and then writing the Swift code uh, for Android applications. But our goal was as soon as you have this code, you can take it and put into Android Studio and start building. Um, so the, the, I, I, the, I, our next steps is just our plans and uh, uh, this is important, especially for Android. Android has a jetpack. So Android, starting from the API level 28, they started to use everywhere the Jetpack. Jetpack is a open source implementation of a lot of functions and so on. And nowadays, if you want to go above uh, level 28, you need to be able to provide also a Swift API for Android Jetpack. So just maybe a remark, the whole Android API we generated, so we do not write it manually, of course. So we take Basically, we can take any jar file and generate a Swift API for this, and it will be as similar as possible to the original Java code. So we are doing now the same for Jetpack for all the Android APIs over the level 28. Um, we are going also to do a bit more deep integration into the, our IDE so that for the community it will be more easy to create uh, the Fusion packages, the Swift packages, which can be reused on both platforms, which access the, the Android API. And the one a, a cool thing which I uh, want to mention briefly, why I also showed the SkateKit framework. Um, everybody wants to use a Swift UI. Imagine if it would be great to have at least a subset of Swift UI, which I can render on the Android. This would simplify the development drastically. And there are two projects um, the people try and they rebuild the Swift API. It's open source, it's one at Tokamark and one is open Swift UI. And for this project, basically what you need is a render. You, you, you need a backend which will render it. And coming back to these slides is uh, basically the whole idea is that we take this Kate Phoenix and use it uh, for these open source projects in order to be able to render um, Swift UI on Android. And this is our next steps, and I think we'll have maybe this year, even or beginning of the next year, the first results because the, the Tokamak uh, library, the open source project, um, they use already uh, several backends, and one is based on GTK, and we support GTK as well. So I think it will be really cool to have also a subset of the Swift UI, which can be compiled for Android. This would be the greatest uh, thing ever because uh, we use now SVG, but uh, you know we never edit them. If you open an, S, an SVG file, you just you got lost. So these are our, um, our next steps and. Uh, yeah, they, our QR codes, you can follow, uh, you can write me an email, you can follow us on a Medium, we write in uh, tutorials, there are articles about the applications, examples, how we create them. 
And um, we have also a GitHub organization skate platform. There you can find a lot of uh, links to Fusion uh, documentation guides, how to create this, that, that uh, uh, etc. And uh, yeah, just QR code of our skate uh, web page where you can download the IDE. Everything is packed together. You can just open and uh, create uh, stuff, and you can execute it immediately in the Android emulator or on iOS. You can build APK, IP, and you can just deploy it immediately to the App Store. Um, yeah, so if you uh, if you have questions, uh, I, 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 I let a little bit more time for questions because most likely, yeah, the uh, hi, so. First of all, congratulations for for your work. Very nice effort. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question was about the compatibility with uh, Swift UI and uh, the concurrency framework from Apple, and also the macros that is are new, but uh, they will be used a lot, I think. Uh, yes. So we are we are working now on macro. Porting, it's not so complicated because the it's it doesn't touch a lot of uh, backend functionality of the compiler. The Swift UI is not supported, so the Swift UI is is a, is a library which is closed source, so we don't have the sources. So as, as soon as we write import Swift UI, we cannot find this framework on Android. But the rest, which uh, is just the language, is fully supported. So we have the full support of concurrency, async, await, everything what you can find in Swift 5.8 can be ported as long as we have a foundation. So we can use foundation or any package SPM, which depends only on foundation, uh, which doesn't use uh, Objective-C libraries, something like this. The, 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 the goal always is to check whether the libraries are available or can be built for Android. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, um, it's a it's a great project. Um, you mentioned uh, in the beginning um, Kotlin multi-platform, which uh, we've worked with a bit, and they made a conscious decision not to include UI code. So I think it's interesting to see that you go all the way. Um, can you highlight maybe a, a few other decisions that you made differently from from KMM, um, and and what are the differences, except for <laughs> the language, obviously. Um, uh, uh, so we have to look at the levels. If we take a look at, at, at two uh, up to the level three, we, we are a Kotlin native, but from the iOS side. So, so we have a generator, we do everything to support Swift code on Android, but without UI. But we still continue to work and we believe that we can bring Swift UI uh, uh, together with the uh, guys working on this open source implementation. We believe that we can bring it to Android and make possible to use also uh, graphical parts and make them cross-platform using the native uh, technology uh, created by Apple, Swift UI. At least a subset of Swift UI should work. And uh, for many, many kinds of applications, it's really, you, you don't need a, lo a, a lot of features there, or the, the most code can be shared and then some specific stuff can be uh, implemented uh, for the particular platform separately. Got it. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding the UI that you showed, because you mentioned that we can access the buttons and so on, but how do you handle localization for both of the features? Um, uh, I didn't answer to, uh, to synchronize the. Uh, yeah, you you mentioned that we can access buttons. Yeah. On them, but how do you handle localization for like text fields for the labels? It has to be done uh, separately. So this, uh, as I said, the skate kit framework. What we can notice is we are the smaller team, so we will never catch the the development of uh, both platforms. That's why the skate kit we use it as a part. That's why we also uh, moved shifted before to the levels where we have to do uh, native work for the native platform. 
Because if we can share something, we share using the, the, the skate kit, if we have a nice design or so something like this, we can render it, but then implement uh, uh, features which are not, which we haven't created. We just program them for every uh, platform separately. Thank you. Uh, super quick question. So if you use cross-platform libraries like uh, OpenS and Sound, which runs pretty much everything, how do you go about this? Let's say you have like exit framework and then you can embed some Android counterpart or don't you support those pre-built binaries or how do you solve the challenges like that? Every, uh, so on the Android, starting from the, like switching to the Android, we work with the binaries, like with the, with the libraries which are built. So if you have an XC framework, so XC framework I found is a really nice feature, but never, at least uh, in the 5.8, never worked as it was uh, promoted. So I'm waiting um, the time when I can, in XC framework, I can write Android and put a binary there and just use it in a XC, in a Swift package manager. This is the, the goal where we are going, basically. How are you using it right now? So do you have separate like XC framework and something else for Android, right? Or do you, do you use just some different pre-built or? No, no, we just, you, uh, from the point of, from the Android point of view, we have just a normal dynamic library. So you just differently uh, embed uh, for iOS and conditionally embed for yes. LK clear. So at the, at, at the end, that's why the, the code sharing is done inside the package uh, um, SPM. So I have a package Swift at the end. I always have uh, my dynamic library for my application, which is linked to the GVM. And um, she's, the, the library is located inside the APK. So it, it basically, technically, all communication is done using GNI on JVM side, but the, a lot of code is uh, the, the most code is generated, so we do not try it manually. Yeah, clear. It's just this very similar formula we had to face to embed one binary into multiple platforms. So that's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. Hello. So I have two questions uh, related to the project, which looks really interesting to me. The first one is, do you have any big or popular application that is already online on Play Store that we can test? And the second one is, um, I, you can guarantee the sustainability of the project in the long run, because right now it seems like a good open source project, but uh, I'm scared that if I start to use this framework in the long run, maybe, I don't know, maybe the project will fail and how can you continue to develop for Android? Yeah, this is a good question. That's why we define these uh, four levels because um, we use this primarily for our internal products. So we build applications using Xcode or Android Studio and then we just reuse and share the code and just use it in, in the application. So, we don't have applications built from ground up using uh, our framework. That's why we defined these labels and we split it so that a community can start using the parts which are suitable for your project. So if you take the compiler and build the Swift code, you have, of course, you are less dependent from us um, compared to the level four if you take the Skid Kit framework and you start using it and at some point then uh, we are not there. It's it's a problem, but I think as long as you use a compiler just to compile the libraries and the libraries are available uh, uh, online, nothing can change because the Swift compiler itself is an open source. So the community, I think, can always invest a little bit and, and, and support it. Thank you. But a good question, because this was always uh, our problem. If you take a cross-platform framework, you have to live with this uh, framework forever. You cannot just then take it, throw away, and rewrite everything. That's why we decided, well, we go this step by step and, and offer this level of integration, depending on the project. How are you dealing with uh, Android's uh, resource management, like our assets? 
um, you have to access everything using the Android API. So there's no like layer in between that for you or? No, not, not yet. So uh, it's the, the idea, we gather the ideas and we, we can look into it, but now uh, no special uh, handling. So we just use API only. Okay, thank you. Let's give a huge round of applause uh, to give it. Thank you.